Okay, so now we come back to the familiar page 134. I've changed it again. Just a little recap. What we're looking at here is a substrata of meters between the Eudokian and the Epinon anaphora, which tally to different sevens depending on how you look at them. They deliberately tally to 33 sevens, then 45 sevens, and the sum of those two is 78 sevens. Okay, in other words, the Eudokian anaphora is 33, the Epinon is 45, and when you add them up, the number of sevens is 78. And I went through all that in the earlier pages of this um, Ephesians 1 Reparse document, starting around page 126. So if, you haven't, if you're not familiar with that, then you really probably want to turn off this video now because it'll just go over your head. Unless you just want to learn the basic timeline, because that's all I'm going to cover here. So we come down here, and Paul's making an issue of 78 sevens because he's playing on Isaiah. Isaiah crafted his time poem in 1078 syllables, okay, to show the 1,078 years from the birth of first David to the death of last David on the schedule that was in effect then. And our BCAD problem comes in because we're, we're mistaking the Bible's reading because we do not know this doctrine about time. And so when you add up, these are the color codes now are different time tracks. If you don't recognize that God is operating time based on his rules for time, which has to do with the 1050, then you can't distinguish one time track from another and you're gonna end up adding up the years wrong. And that's what happened, okay? So when Paul goes to reconcile the 1077s, he's not adding up the years wrong. He's showing how God's timing reconciles all time tracks via church back to Adam and forward to the millennium. That's the purpose of this thing here. That's why he's doing it. So the question is, well, what is he doing? All right, so we go back here. And I've recolor coded. This is a time track now. I've changed the meaning of the colors. This blue is a certain time track. So every time you see blue, it's tracking the same time track. And sometimes they overlap with other time tracks. All right? And the blue goes all the way down to seven years plus the millennium, seven years beyond the end of the millennium. Okay? We'll go through what that is. Then we have a second time track that's in green. The green time track is subdivided into two. So you got light green and dark green, but they reference the same idea. They're just referencing it at different points. So the green time track is continuing onward all the way throughout. Okay. And I haven't worked out all of this yet for the green. But I will. Okay. Then underneath those two colors, those are the two main tracks, underneath those two colors are subdivisions of the green track. I couldn't use more green or it would be too confusing. Subdivisions of the green track specifically related to David, first David and last David, because that's what Paul's reconciling to. And then the purple track is Paul's own, he's, he's playing an equidistance game with the fact that he's writing at a certain time. Okay? So that's basically it. You got blue time track, green time track, subdivisions of green that are sort of in a tannish color. All right? So that's the third color, basic color. All right, with different shades. And then the fourth color is purple for Paul's own reconciliation based on when he writes. He's making a point of writing when he does. 
he picks when to write based on picking up where Mary left off. He's elaborating on what Mary said. So you know a lot of things immediately. Since he's picking up where Mary leaves off, everybody knew what Mary said that day, because Zacharias is all also metering uh, in Luke 1 to play on Mary. Everybody knows that day what she's speaking is going to be canon. That's why Luke writes it down. So it was all it was an immediate oral canon what she said in the Magnificat that day. And everybody used it since and Luke wrote it down. Okay, Luke is the second gospel, Matthew is first. Mark doesn't have to write it down or reference it because it was already written by Luke. So that's why Mark's gospel is so short. And John, of course, is writing a, a generation later and he's tying up the loose ends. So we got four colors. Again, first time track is blue, second time track is green, that's subdivided into two shades. Beneath the green are tan time tracks that are related to the green. And then the fourth color is purple that relates to when Paul writes. Okay? So now let's go through them. I said some things that I don't think are right now, and I'm going to correct them. Our blue time track starts from Noah's birth and is obviously a time track that God is charting because 1050 from Noah's birth, Jacob is born. And as you probably know, Isaac was 60 years old before Jacob was born. So God timed Jacob's birth. So this 1050 is deliberate. The only one who could have made it happen is God. So he's doing this on purpose. So it's important. Okay? The second time track is based on Abraham. And this is also very deliberate because 1050 from Abraham's becoming super mature, which resulted in the birth of Isaac, David is crowned king at Hebron. Okay? So the theme of the blue time track is Noahic. And Paul's meter is Noahic for that reason. The theme of the green time track is Abram to David. And so Paul's meter reflects that value as well. This is where the ten, why 1077. Okay? In other words, the promise to Abraham was that his son, that kings would come from him, from his wife actually, and that the Messiah would be born from his loins. Well, here's the king, and then King Messiah is going to be born from his loins. Okay, so it's a separate accounting contract from the one to Noah. Abraham got his own covenant. Noah got his own covenant. Okay, Noah's covenant is a civilization covenant. So in a way, but not quite the same, is Abraham's. Abraham's is a people covenant. People and land. Noah got a civilization covenant about the world. So that's the essential difference between these two. When God is tracking along the Noahic lines, he's tracking the world, the time the world is allotted to live. When he's tracking along Abraham's lines, he's tracking to the Jews, to, and specifically to Messiah. Messiah is the inheritor of all the covenants to the Jews. Okay, that's what Paul is explaining in Galatians 3. God didn't say to seeds, but to seed. I believe that's Galatians 3.16, meaning Christ. So if you're a preterist, I'm sorry, you're anti-biblical, because the, the promises about Israel's future time are to Christ. Israel inherits through Christ. Okay, and we're gonna, you're going to see why that's true, because this timeline is tracking that, the inter interaction of that issue. Okay, so Noahic is blue, Abrahamic, which, uh, you know, eventuates in David and therefore Messiah, is green. Okay, now, there are sub-issues related to David's birth and the Lord's er birth in order for this contract to be realized. So, these colors here that are sort of in tannish colors elaborate more on the green 
all right? And then Paul's tying it all up to civilization again based on when he writes. Okay, and there's a lot of overlap. So let's go through it. Number one, correction. Noah's birth, 1056. <clears throat> I was saying that that was seven years late because 1050 was the end of the first unit. But it's not, it, that's not relevant to what God's doing. It's not early six years late. Noah's birth is an award to his father, Lamech. Lamech must have achieved some kind of spiritual maturation because he's listed as in the Hall of Fame of Genesis 5. The Hall of Fame is a contiguous list, a continuous line of Hall of Famers to show the you know, the trace down to the birth of Abraham, really. Okay? <clears throat> but this, this, this is beside the point. This is just the year he was born. However, he's the guy who came through the flood. He's the guy to whom God gave a covenant. That's where the relevance actually lies instead. So, did God keep his promise to Noah to whom God awarded a 1050. God awarded him that 1050 in 1556 from Adam, signified by the birth of his triplets, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem being first. Shem means name, but pointed to carry the name. Shem will be the guy to carry the name of Messiah. That's where we get the word Semite from. It's really Shemite, okay? So it means name. It means reputation, person. You know, when we say carry the name, it means the inheritor. All right? So this is actually a measure of whether God's keeping his promise to Noah. All right? That's a civilization promise. He said to Noah, I'm not going to destroy the world. Here's my rainbow to prove it. So think about that for a minute. I had to get a cup of coffee. Okay, I'm back. Let's make sure I'm recording because I've tried this before and it didn't work. It's working. All good. Okay. So this is a civilization covenant to Noah. It has nothing to do with being Jewish or not. It has to do with the world being preserved. That's the nature of the covenant. Um, you will hear theologians note that there's a difference in this covenant. They do usually call it civilization. And that's indeed what it is. Noah starts a whole new civilization. So God starts a whole new 1050, but it's measured along different points in Noah's life. All the covenants are. That, the Noahic covenant really begins with the birth of his kids when Noah was 500. But from a different standpoint, God is measuring the 1050 from Noah's birth. I'm not sure why this happens. I don't understand enough about why does he retroactively go to birth, but he does it often. He doesn't do it all the time, but he does do it often. And Paul does the same thing with respect to Christ's birth. Of course, Christ is the last Noah, too, so maybe that's why. But I'm not sure of its significance in backdating it to his birth. Fact is that God is tracking it that way because Jacob's birth, see, birth to birth, Jacob's birth is 1050 years after Noah's. That you know. But again, this the, the fact that this is just after this is just after the close of the 2100 years and this is just after the close of the 1050 years. It's not late because there was already somebody who won the 1050 by that time. Okay. Now, as you track this, 
there is something that ends up interfering as a counter track related to the same data. Israel rejects God as king 2,000 years after Noah was born. It's not, I mean, I, I, he, there was nothing that happened a thousand years after he was born that had to be tracked. This is just related to, you know, when he was born. Okay. She rejects God as king in 3056 from Adam. And almost everybody in scholarship for the last, I don't know, 200 years will tell you that that year is 1050 BC. There's a lot of support for it that the scholars don't know that they have. But they do, there's a consensus that that's when that happened. That Saul was elected king after Israel was rejecting God as king in 1050 BC. The support is strongest right here. The meter of Psalm 90, the dateline meter in the first paragraph that's divisible by seven in the Psalm in Hebrew, says that it's being written 63 sevens after the slavery. Now 63 sevens and the slavery, you have to remember, 10 years of it were for Joseph and 390 years were for Israel proper after um, Joseph had retired. Okay, first 40 years after he retired and then during that time he died. Um, everything was nice and then um, there was a sort of encroachment, an eminent, do eminent domain encroachment on the land of Goshen in the name of building granary cities. And that's how Israel became enslaved as temple building slaves. It was the cushiest kind of job you could get. But still, it was technically slavery. Now, Moses knows this. They all knew it from <clears throat> being in it. And what he's doing is he's setting up a parallel. He's saying that <clears throat> he's writing... 63 sevens from the enslavement in those two pieces, 10 and 390, and then, you know, the extra 40 years. So that was 430 years that they were actually in the land, excluding Joseph. He's saying that that same time amount is at the beginning of the 1051st year of the flood, the beginning of it. And then there's 350 syllables in the poem, so that's 350 years, which took you to the 1051st year before Messiah is born. He's bracketing his poem that way. So that ends up agreeing with the scholars who say, and, and then most of them do, that this event happened in 1050 BC. Now that's really important because if it happened in 1050 BC, then 1050 BC should have been our 1 AD should have been 4106 from Adam just using the Bible's own numbers how the Bible adds up all the numbers from Adam forward when you get to this point of what we call 1 AD if this is 1050 BC and like I said, you can reason it that way based on the meter alone. And scholars don't know about the meter, so they're using other, other ways. That gets to R1 AD by the way we measure time. That's 4106 from Adam. That is not 4100 from Adam. It's 4106. Okay? If you add up the Bible it's 4106. Now I suspect that the reason why they come up with 4100 is because instead of looking at the Bible they're looking at Bishop Usher. Bishop Usher, he was like in the medieval, you know, during the 
I want to say 1500s. He was the guy, he just truncated this to 4100. He didn't actually add up the numbers properly. And nobody bothered to check his math. All right? That's the only thing I can come up with because if you just look at the Bible yourself, you will get 4106 years to bring you to an exodus date of 1440, which we would call BC, a flood year of what we would call 2450 BC. These are very commonly cited dates. A temple dedication of 950 BC. Now there's a lot of variants here, but that, that's going to get us into the heart of our story. So I'll talk about that more in a minute. I, I just want you to focus on this. How we get to 1 AD is based on this time track from Noah, going all the way back to Noah, which is going all the way back to Adam and simply adding up the numbers in the Bible, treating them as solar years, you know, stick in the throat, vanilla accounting. Now, it gets a little dicey when you start talking about, you know, well, what was the time of Jacob and what was the time of Abraham and there's, there's some variances there. Because the Bible changes the way it tells you what time it is. It's not simply going by birth like it does in Genesis 5. It starts changing the way it talks about it with Noah in Genesis 7. Okay? So you have to be real careful how you do your math. But if you did your math right, what we call 1 AD would be year 4106 from Adam, not 4100 like Bishop Usher came up with. And again, people aren't looking back at the Bible, they're looking at Bishop Usher. So that's why they say 4100 is 1 AD. And that creates the, you know, the variation in scholarship that you see, uh-oh. That creates the variation in scholarship that you see which tries to set back all the dates by six years. Okay, because they some of them are actually looking at the Bible and they're coming up with an extra six years. And it's like, what? What? So that's why you'll see some people say that Christ was born 6 B.C. or 6 A.D. Because they don't know what to do with the extra six. Okay, but I'm going to show you what you can do. Because it's a different story altogether than they're thinking. So that's our time track one. 1050 here. And then this problem occurs in what we would call 1050 BC pretty universally in scholarship. Okay, so if you go forward from Jacob, the temple is dedicated 1050 years later. That's temple year one. See, the Bible is always saying years from a particular thing or person or event. And the trick is, is to add up the persons and the events and attach them to the right prior person or event. And that's a tricky thing to do. That's why you have so much variation on Bible dates. And that's why people basically give up and just rely on dear doctor so-and-so. Because it's kind of hard to go through that. The easiest way to do it is to keep reconciling everything back to Adam. <clears throat> it took me about... I want to say six months to do this. Okay, so if you track here, your next stop in the 1050 is when the temple is dedicated. That's nine, what we call 950 BC. This is our baseline. This is where we get it from. Okay, we call that 950 BC generally. Okay, there is some variance for reasons you're going to see in a few minutes. So, that's our next stop, temple dedication, temple year one, we tend to call 950 BC. All right? So the next stop after that is 1050 years later. I'm sorry, not there. 1050 years later, which is um, 3156, 3156 plus 1050. 4206, we're overshot the field. That's right here. 4207, we're past the millennium now. We're seven years past the millennium. Now you might say to me, well, Brando, then that means we're seven years late on that timeline. 
because that would be temple year 1050. Fair enough. I'm, I'm, you know, I haven't resolved all this yet. Fair enough. Maybe we really are seven years late after all. Because to get to temple year 1050, you have to add seven years past the millennium. And Paul is doing that in his accounting. Okay? But just know that's how this timeline is working. And as a result of this timeline, we're coming up with the date that Israel rejects God as king and Saul gets appointed as 1050 B.C. You with me? Okay, so now, 1050 years after Israel rejects God as king, which should be what? 1 A.D. Really the end of 1 B.C. There is no 0 B.C., so you have to just do 1 B.C. and then 1 A.D. Okay? 1050 after Israel rejects God as king is year 4106 from Adam's fall. 4106. That is 2,000 years after Jacob was born. This is 1050 years after Jacob was born. Temple dedicated. This is 2,000 years after Jacob is born. So a lot of people say, because they don't understand, because they're using this as their system, they're taking shortcuts, they're thinking Jacob was born in the year 2000. He wasn't If you're using this as your baseline, this is what you come up with. Okay? Uh, again, that's this time track from Noah's birth to Jacob's birth. From Jacob's birth to this. But then we got this intervening. And 1050 years after. Israel rejects God as king, which everybody thinks is 1050 B.C. It's 2,000 years after Jacob is born. You with me? So this is how we get our numbers. But unfortunately, we end up not being able to track our own numbers because we're using Bishop Usher. Who thinks that there was 4,100 years to Christ. Okay? He, he didn't do his math right. So that's our first time track. That's blue. That's where blue takes you. Now let's go to our second time track. Based on Abram. Abram super matured 2046. He was 100 years old at that point. Okay? That's when Isaac is born. This is 54 years before the civilization 2100 closed. So the progenitor of the Jews, Abraham, renamed Abraham at that point, meaning the contract, the time grant, the whole bit, was granted to him then. He's 54 years early. Now the thing that's real important about that is that Noah's time grant started in 1556. 1556 plus 490 is 2046. So the very year that Noah's 490 ran out, and therefore history should have ended, that's when Abram super matures. But that is 54 years prior to the civilization. The two 1050s equal 2100. So he qualifies, but there's a 54 year credit as in essence. Okay, so the purpose of this time track is to make sure that that 54-year credit is maintained, or how, or if not maintained, how does it get spent? That's exactly what Mary's trying to analyze in the Magnificat. That's what Paul is tracking to here. That's what Moses was doing. That's what Isaiah was doing. That's what Daniel was doing. 
They all know that this 54 year credit has to play. 50 years of it are supposed to be harvesting the Gentiles, but there's a four year extra piece. It's really 53.5. Because of when Abram supermatured, and he had to do it then, early, because Noah's 490 was running out. So now God's tracking, okay? 1050 from Abram's supermaturation is what? David King at Hebron. Now, four years after he was crowned king, the third 1000 finishes. It's 1050, 1050, 1050. So the first two 1050s are 2100. The third one would therefore be 3150. But at 3100, that's when the voting period for unbelievers begins. So he's, he's just inside the mark, baby. But relative to the actual end of the period, which would be 3150, you'll notice that that's 40, 54 years, and this is 54 years. So the 54-year credit still owed the Gentiles is being maintained, carried forward. You'll also notice that when David is crowned king, that's 430 years after the Exodus. Okay? That's 1,440 years after the flood. The 430 years is a play. It's a mirror. It's a reimbursement on the time that Israel was in Egypt. Exodus 12, 40-41 says that Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. So David is crowned on the flip side of the Exodus, okay, 430 years. I'll just make sure I'm still recording, okay. I've, I've been having problems with the recording all day. All right, so that's the green time track. So let's follow that one now. A thousand years after David's Hebron kingship, okay, is 4096. Okay, but the Hebron kingship was just at Hebron. He was not king of all Israel until 3103. That was seven years after this date. Messiah has to be born king of all Israel, not just Hebron. So seven years later, David became king of all Israel. And a thousand years after that, is 4103 from Adam, not 4106. This is what's giving rise to our 4 BC. There's a true basis for it, is what I'm trying to tell you. The Lord has to be born a thousand years after this date because the thousands are contiguous. When one person gets a thousand year time grant, like David did here, by the time that thousand is up, somebody else has to pick up the baton, the time baton. A thousand years after David united kingship is the later of the two time batons. So the Lord's deadline for being born is the latest of the deadlines for that thousand. That thousand is more is earlier than this deadline of 1050 after God was rejected as king. So he has to be born three years earlier because this is the latest of the thousand year deadlines. See, just like Abraham, Abraham is super maturing relative to history. He's super maturing 54 years early. But Noah's time grant ran out in 2046. So Abraham had to super mature by then. It's an earlier deadline. This is the precedence for it, so you can see it clearly all on one page. I love one page explanations. Okay? So as you can see, relative to the 1050, he's early. But relative to Noah's time grant of the 490 years, he's, he's right at the edge. The same thing is happening here. David's time grant from his united kingship is the latest of his kingship grants. So that extends the deadline. But relative to this deadline, which is on the blue time track, 
the Lord has to be born three years early. And I'll pick up more in the next increment.